Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If I had to title the message, I'd title it, Tarry One for Another. We need to tarry, first off, for children. They are the future of the church. Uh, we talked a little bit about what that word meant, to, to receive, to wait for. Um, children are going to have struggles growing up. This world, the 1940s and 50s and 60s are, are over. This world is not what it used to be. It, it just keeps waxing worse and worse and worse. No more can you leave the windows open. No more can you leave your doors unlocked. No more can you just walk, have your child just walk the streets to the neighbor to grab butter or sugar. You, those days are about over. We need to pray for our children. We need to tarry for them. They're the future. We need to help them and be there and tarry to wait for them as they, they're gonna struggle through thoughts. They're going to have to wrestle through ideas, and we should be there as an encouragement to them. We should be a breath of fresh air, sunshine uh, coming down on them, not a dark cloud hovering over them. We're going to have to tarry. Deuteronomy 6 says, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When thy walkest by the way, when thy liest down, and when thy riseth up. And I understand that's that's Israel's stuff. I understand that was God speaking to that nation. But we can draw some really practical application from that. You're laying down. You're rising up. You're out in the way. You're at your house. Tarry, tarry for your children. Teach them. Guide them. We also need to tarry for the weak. Every military has weak soldiers. Every sports team has weak players. Every martial arts school has weak fighters. And every church will have weak members. Someone that got saved last month is not going to be as far along as someone that's been saved for two decades. You can't expect that. We're going to have to tarry. Um, as they come along in the faith and we need to be there again, not as a dark cloud, but as a just tarrying for them, just waiting for them and giving them time to grow and to learn. And really, when you when you when you think about tarrying for the weak, we should care for them, care for the weak. That's in direct proportion to their weakness. Okay? If you're real, real strong in the faith, and you're real, real strong at, for example, knocking on someone's door and speaking to somebody one-on-one -on -one about the Lord, and you can go through and you know where to go on your verses and all that, you don't need me there. <laughs> if you're that guy, you don't need another brother or sister there but there's somebody that might there's somebody that might that's called discipleship it's called coming along somebody and trying to help them out why so that you can bring them up to the level that you're at the idea of a good new testament bible believing bible teaching church is that everyone would start to rise up and lord willing they should know the Bible as good or better than the preacher. As in, I'm not intimidated by anybody's Bible knowledge. You know more than me, good. <laughs> you have a better way of speaking to a Mormon or Jehovah's Witnesses? Good. You, you take it. I don't, I don't need to. You have at it. If I'm weak in that area, I'll step back, watch, and learn. I've got no problem with that. Neither should you. We, if you're strong in an area, be willing to help out that weaker brother or sister. The Bible says in Romans 15, 1, when then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. It's the mark of a true Bible-believing church. Some people are hungry. If you feed them, they'll get stronger. 
Somebody comes in here and they're hungry for the word of God. You know what you got to feed them? The word of God. And they'll get stronger. If you don't feed them the word of God, they're not going to be any better off than they were the day before. Bible talks about some that are feeble minded, some that are carnal minded, some that are double minded. I think they might need some help. May I remind you that at one time you were one, two, or all three of those. <laughs> May I remind you that in some areas of your life and in some areas of my life right now, we are one, two, or all three of those. Well, Christians shouldn't be carnally minded, except when you get to the point where you're in a situation and you're handling it carnally doesn't apply then. <laughs> it's 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 tough pe preaching the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> and stop. We need people to come alongside of us. We're supposed to be of one mind, one mind striving together for the hope of what? The gospel. Faith of the gospel. Have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. The Bible says in verse 2. Fulfill ye, fulfill ye my joy. That ye be like minded. Having the same love. Being of, accord, of one accord. Of one mind. Let nothing be done. Through strife. Or vain glory. But what if. Yeah, but see, when you put in the what ifs, that goes against let nothing. <laughs> yeah, but this situation is, yeah, but the Bible says let nothing. Yeah, but you don't understand how this person, yeah, but the Bible says let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Why is it when somebody hurts you, you want to pass from the Bible to do something to them so that you can appear to be the superior one? I just don't do just forget about trying to get the glory out of that. Forget about the strife. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. This really helps us tarry one for another because this world philosophy. And may I warn you at the same time, remind you. That this self-esteem. Gospel, this self-esteem philosophy. That has been taken from this wicked world has been injected into churches. So the idea is to build everybody's self-esteem up so they go feeling really, really good about themselves. And I would submit to you that that is not Bible preaching. Bible teaching, Bible preaching, Christian living is about Jesus Christ being magnified and him having the preeminence in all things. And us getting as low as we can and just thinking of others more than ourselves that's pretty evident with the newborn baby because mama and papa now esteem that child and they don't think of their needs they're going to have to skip some meals they're going to have to skip some hours of sleep they're going to have to skip some date nights they're going to have to skip The whatever the fill in the blank downtime is. Why? Because it's all about the baby. <laughs> it's all about that newborn. And if we can get a hold of that principle and apply it to our tarrying one for another, how Paul's finishing out 1 Corinthians 11, I think we'd all be better Christians for it. We need to tarry for doubters. There are people honestly out there seeking the truth. There are people in churches all the time that are that they're not insincere rebels they're not troublemakers that's not who they are they're just doubters they just got some doubts they just have some questions there's nothing wrong with those people they're in churches every church we have to tarry for them you have to be there to help give some answers you imagine we hit persecution in America and start imagining it because it's coming down the pipe. How bad it's going to get in our lifetime, I can't tell you. But imagine persecution hits really, really bad next month. And a group of us have to flee town. We get into this abandoned town 
as we're fleeing out of here, as we're fleeing persecution. And we get to the center of that town. It's late at night. It's dark. Buildings are boarded up. We've never been to that town before, but there's two roads leading out of that town. And most of the people agree and are confident that we should take that road based on geography and based on his, uh, you know, their, his, uh, their experience and history and being in a certain area. They were, they're, they're a hundred percent confident, but you know what you got out? You know who else you got? You've got people that aren't so sure about that. You need to come to that situation and they're going to be doubting. Mom, do you think we really should go that way? Someone's going to turn to you, your best friend, Joe, and he's going to say, I don't know. I don't know. But the majority of the people are confident. That's the road we've got to go. So what do we say to all the doubters? Okay, well, be warned and filled. Go ahead your way. We'll see you when you fall into your bath. Have a great one. No, we don't say that as Christians. We tarry one for another. We say, look, we're going to go on. We're confident this is the way to go. But look, we will not get too far ahead of y'all. We'll make sure we set a campfire. We'll make sure we'll leave you a signal. We'll make sure we leave you a trail so you can find us. Why? Tarry one for another. Don't hold it against somebody because they have some doubt. Try to find a way to build that person up, to edify that person. There are many doubters. There are many wanderers. First Timothy chapter two, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Have you prayed like that all the time? We should pray everywhere. How many of you do that? We should pray without wrath and without doubting. How many of you can say 100% you've always prayed without doubting? Now, that's a tough one because none of us can. None of us. I'm not saying don't try to live this command. I charge you to do it. I charge myself to do it. But you got to admit, there's times when doubt seeks in our own lives. When Jesus said in John 13, verily, verily, I send you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. They had some doubt. They were with Jesus. The disciples, what did they tell Thomas in, in, in John 20? We, we saw Jesus. He said, now, unless I put my hands to his nail prints and, and his suicide and, and, and all that, I, he said, Thomas said, I will not believe. There's doubters. How do we tarry for the doubter? You got to give them some space. You got to give them some time to grow. You got to give them some more light from where? From the word of God. And let God's word, the light of God's word, help them out. They're going to need time and space to chew on it. Why is this so important? Young people especially pay attention. The world is tarrying for you. The devil's waiting for you and your family. The nightlife doesn't end. And they're waiting. The doors are always open. The world is tarrying for Christians. Come on. They're patiently waiting. And they'll be ready to receive you. Are we as fervent as this wicked world is? We should be ready to receive. We should be praying to receive. We spoke to someone Today, Josiah and I came to the church house and they were in the back there and we had talked to them before and I said, you know, we really love to have you come into church and we've got evening service at six o'clock. It'd be great for the little kids. You know, they're out back playing. 
finally I said, I said the, the kids are wanting to see what church looks like. I'm thinking they probably never even seen the, the inside of a church house. So I said, uh, I said to the dad, hey, your kids want to see what a church looks like? They want to see? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, hey, I'll, I'll take you through. So we took him in through the back door, showed him the office, showed him the fellowship hall, showed him the, the toys. They got excited about that. And then took him upstairs and showed him. This is where we open up the Bible up here. We pray up here. We sing up here to Jesus. He's your creator. And gave, gave the Father some some gospel tracks and some information. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be here. We'll be here. Then they're not here. But we're ready to receive them. We're tarrying. We're praying. Say, well, that's just a waste of time. Those people are, remember, you were those people. Maybe you weren't as down and out physically, monetarily. Maybe you weren't that down low on the social ladder. Will you tarry one for another? You think of this big course. Imagine having this real, real, real big course. You know, they got the they got the organ. That's a powerful instrument. They got the piano. That's a powerful instrument. Then they got the cello. That's a real powerful instrument. They've got the guitar. That's a powerful instrument. And then there's a guy that plays the flute. So the music director has everybody up and, you know, everybody's playing, everybody's playing. And then there's one part in the song where that little flute has to come into play. And the flute player just sits there. And he don't play his part. And so the music director stops everything. And there's a big crowd. Now, if the music director didn't stop that, nobody would have even known there was a flute part. <laughs> the whole thing would have kept going. You got big major instruments going. That crowd's not going to miss the flute. But the flute player is sitting there thinking, I'm unimportant. Nobody cares about me. My part doesn't matter. Nobody tarries for the flute guy. It's such a small, insignificant instrument. But the music director noticed, and he stops everybody and he says, Where's the flute? And he makes a big deal about the guy that was supposed to play his small little part. And he said, Look, that's important. I noticed. I noticed you. I noticed that you had a part. And so many times people think that they play an insignificant part. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the big picture is the Lord's trying to get them to understand that, look, you're making this ordinance insignificant by doing these small little things that are off that all build up into one big, blow up and it don't even make it an ordinance anymore and the Lord's saying look every little part matters that music conductor he knew that that song would be incomplete without the flute and he noticed I want to notice I want you to notice tarry one for another the Lord set the thing up so that the body of Christ would have to unite. So when you leave or you don't play your part, it just hurts the body. Same with that big orchestra. Guy's got that little triangle. Ding, ding, ding. You know, it, it, what, it's not a major instrument. Well, I'll just leave. No, it doesn't. You hurt the choir. You don't help it. You don't help it. Christ wants us together. Verse 34. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse number 34. The Bible says, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order 
when I come. What was the purpose of coming together to the Lord's Supper? Well, it was not to satisfy your physical hunger. The purpose was not for you to leave, to leave with a belly full of food. It's not the Olive Garden. You got hunger pangs? Eat at home. It wasn't designed for gratifying physical appetite. Now, it's confusing for a lot of people. There is some difference of opinion on this verse. Because let's face it, in the Corinthian church, what did they do? They did have another full meal. And you'd be hard pressed to go to a church nowadays where you're going to have a full spread of food and then and then have the Lord's Supper. You'd be really hard pressed to do that. Now, if somebody does that, I'm not going to say they're wrong, but if somebody doesn't do that, I'm not going to say they're wrong either. Because to me, the idea is the purpose is you should be filled spiritually. And that's why it says in verse 34 if any man hunger, let him eat at home. There's nothing wrong with just having a small piece of bread and a sip or two of whatever fruit of the vine you're using. And then people go home hungry. It's not like you didn't do the ordinance right if somebody leaves and say, well, we didn't really do the Lord's Supper right because my belly's still growling. Make sense? Now, if there's a church that does that and they have a big spread and they're still able to make it work and they have Christ as the preeminence and they really keep this ordinance and it's not a mess like 1 Corinthians 11, okay, have at it. I've, I've not been in one that, 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 that does it that way. I'm not saying, saying that there aren't any. I just don't know of any. What was the purpose? We already have been through all the doctrinal stuff. The purpose was clearly the remembrance of Christ's work on Calvary Street. You don't have that, you don't have the ordinance. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. You fulfill your physical hunger at home. And this, again, closes out this distinction. First Corinthians 11, we saw the first half, the distinction, men and women. We see the same thing closing out the second half, First Corinthians 11. What is there? There's a distinction between the physical meal and then the Lord's Supper. It can't be treated as a common meal. If you do this in remembrance of Christ, you've got it right. It's not dining out for God. You know, too many times we go to a big buffet and it's just like pigs at a trowel. You know, let's just get all you can eat before, before the line gets too long or before... That's not what this is. That's why they got in trouble. A bunch of gluttons not thinking about the other guy. When they did that, they completely messed the whole thing up. I'm sure you have been in these situations. I've been in these situations where people are coming just to satisfy their physical hunger. If you put up a big sign that says free potluck Sunday at 11, the church house will be filled. Free chicken pot pie. If you found five of the top Bible preachers in America and you said, Hey, come be filled spiritually. We have preacher A, preacher B, preacher C. I would dare say we get half pe half the people come back. Why? Because if you're honest, if you're honest, you have to admit people are more concerned with their physical fulfillment and needs than they are with their spiritual. Brother, so-and-so is preaching. Don't you want to come? No, got dinner plans. We've got free dinner on the grounds on a Friday night. You want to come? Oh, yeah. What are you serving, man?
the, the entire context is spiritual in nature, remembering the Lord's death, remembering the unity of the brethren. And then it, it, it ends with, uh, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. Really, it should be a coming together for some comfort. It should be a coming together for some uniting and remembering the Lord's death on the cross. We talked about that. Go back a couple of verses. I'm going to do a quick review before we finish out one last point. Look at verse 17. What was the problem? Divisions and heresies come together for the worse. Look at verse 18. Uh, I hear there be divisions among you. Verse 19, there must also be heresies. Uh, verse 20 and 21, the problem was they were eating their own supper. They weren't concerned about the Lord's supper. Look at verse 20 says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. Verse 22, he tells them, look, you've got houses to eat in. And then verse 25, uh, 24 and 25, we see the purpose, right? The remembrance. See the end of verse 24, this do in remembrance of me. Same thing at the end of verse 25. Verse 26 and 27, we're told to do it off. And we went through that. We don't have a clear biblical command what oft means. But it should show the Lord's death till he come. We're told to examine ourselves, judge ourselves in the verses that come. And then, so so look, you come not together into condemnation. Do all these things so you don't mess it up. Purpose matters. Remember the message? The matter matters. The matter matters. And then he finishes off. This is a, I don't want to say an odd verse. That would be the right word, choice of phrases to use. But you read it and, and, and you think what the right idea would be for this verse. He goes through all of that and then he ends the chapter with, and the rest will I set in order when I come. We're in trouble again. <laughs> We got more stuff we're going to, I'm telling you. So he said, look, I'm going to come and see you. But it's it, these other things that I have to set in order, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to put in this letter. And isn't that how life is? Some things just, it's not a, a text message is not appropriate. An email just wouldn't put the thing in the proper perspective. A letter or even a phone call sometimes, it's just not the proper way to handle that situation. You need direction? Sure, a text works. <laughs> you got a major issue or there's a major problem that come up or there's something that really needs, you got to get together with the person. And you got to say, you know what? Let's try to get this thing worked out in person. Maybe we should sit down and grab a lunch. Maybe we should sit down and after church and just talk a little bit. But Paul tells them. And the rest will I set in order. When I come. Notice it doesn't say. There's some other things to be in order. But don't worry about. May I submit to you tonight, maybe the demise of a lot of families, maybe the demise of a lot of friendships, maybe the demise of a lot of churches is there's things that need to be set in order and nobody talks about it to get it set in order. <laughs> he said, when I come, the rest. Will I set in order? There's other stuff that's out of order and he's going to come and take the time, but it's stressful. I know. Imagine being told that you messed up the Lord's Supper. He did that by letter. <laughs> if you can get this doctrine right, fellas, you chew on it, you read it, by the time I get there, you should have it all. And then and we got some other stuff. <laughs> we got some other stuff. Ladies, you ever say to your kids, uh, when daddy gets home, he's going to set this thing in order. Maybe you haven't used those words, but.
but it's been that idea. There'll be some laying on of hands, if you will. And why? You need some. You need someone to come and help out. I'm telling you. If there's a situation in your marriage, if there's a situation in your family, if there's a situation with a friend, if there's a situation with a brother or sister in Christ, get with them and set the thing in order. This idea of there's an issue, I'm just going to avoid you. And okay, fine, I'm good with that. I'll just avoid you too. That's not setting it in order. That's not a biblical principle. If something's out of whack, get it back in whack. <laughs> it won't be so wacky. Paul wants to help. He's not going to come and fight with them. I'll set it in order. Yeah, I'll, I'll set her in order. Set it in order? Yeah, I'll set him in order. That's not the attitude of Paul. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk through this thing. We're going to try to make some sense of it. Does that make sense? 